Hello, I'm Brian Levine, and welcome to this session, A Warrior's Journey, Building a Global Application Security Program. Before we get started, just some quick highlights on my background. So these days, I'm Senior Director of Product Security for Axway Software. If you haven't heard of Axway, Axway is an enterprise cloud services provider to Fortune 2000 enterprises and global government customers. My team and I support a global engineering organization with roughly 600 developers in seven R&D locations and over 150 unique products in our catalog. So my formal education is in industrial engineering. And before getting into security full time, I held a number of systems engineering positions delivering secure data management and data protection solutions to federal aerospace and manufacturing businesses. For fun, I also enjoy practicing jujitsu and I don't back down from a challenge, even if it's from my niece, the karate past master pictured here. So this journey began when I was interviewing for a security product management role at a SaaS startup. During the process, I asked if I could speak to their chief security officer and head of security engineering. And so after a few awkward stares, the effective response was, well, we don't have those yet either. And yeah, we'd like you to handle that for us too. And that's where our story begins. So let's have some fun with it. So I'll start off asking you the question, where would you begin? There's an alphabet of soup of standards to choose from. You've got ISO, SOC 2, OWASP, NIST, BSIM, PCI, and on and on and on. If you were tasked with building a security program, it was day one in a new role, which playbook would you use? Is there a script you can follow? Which set of frameworks would you use to get started in the right direction? So my talk today is going to draw on this quote and the wisdoms of the martial arts master and philosopher Bruce Lee. Adapt what is useful, reject what is useless, and add what is specifically your own. And so in that spirit, I'm going to draw on my own experience with some of these frameworks and guidelines and cover the core foundational components that I feel have led to my success and I hope will help you get started. And as well as I hope that you'll take some ideas away from this to advance your own application security program. So what I'm hoping you'll get out of this talk uh, are some strategies and tactics that you can use to develop and improve your program and what we're going to cover in these three core areas. So we'll focus on establishing a security culture. We'll look at developing and scaling security processes, and we'll look at governance for ensuring visibility and executive accountability. So I really look forward to hearing your feedback, questions, and maybe some different opinions, other ideas that maybe you've found to be successful. And uh, also I'm going to try to be brief where I can because of the recorded format and attention spans for watching long videos. So I might gloss over some details, but I'll be happy to cover that in more depth or give you more detail if you just ping me and we can follow up offline. So we'll start with culture. Security is everyone's responsibility. You've probably all heard this declaration in some shape or form in your career. But how do we really implement that? Everyone can't do security all of the time. Developers, managers, operations teams, they all have day jobs to do. So let's unpack this a little bit and talk about some of the key role players and what their responsibilities are in delivering a security program. So the first role we're gonna take a look at is the Central Application Security Group. This, go, this group goes by many names. You may recognize some of these. Uh, if you're looking at the OWASP, uh, SAM, they call it the Secure Software Center of Excellence, or the SSCE, it's a mouthful. Uh, the BSIM calls these, these, uh, this team the secure, sorry, the software security group. Uh, in my company, Axway, we call ourselves the product security group. Uh, I've also worked, uh, with individuals who go by product security office. 
So there's many names, and you may recognize a few. <clears throat> but whatever you choose to call it, uh, let's look at some of the guidance from OWASP, SAM, and, and BSIM, and others on what the, what the roles and responsibilities are for your central security team. So just highlighted in, uh, in red here, a couple of the, uh, the ones that I resonate with and, and have uh, worked well for me. Uh, number one, defining the charter. So make sure that it's defined, written down, and that you've got executive management buy-in and executive sponsorship on the charter. Uh, <clears throat> the security group needs to publish SDLC standards and guidelines for app security. And the product champions are typically the ones that are going to be required and uh, responsible to first select the tools to use within the organization for security scanning and the SDLC process. Excuse me. Uh, also, some very interesting data and pointers from BSIM. So if you look at uh, the BSIM study and what they recommend for the SSG, you can read the slide here, but according to their observations, the very first step is to form an SSG. Without an SSG, success is very unlikely. So they looked at 130 firms in the latest study and noted that every single one of them has a security software group. So basically the message is don't try this at home if you don't have an SSG. Uh, some, also some interesting data from, from this study. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the first red arrow there, the uh, average size is 2% of SSG members to developers. So in other words, for every 100 developers, you have two members on your SSG team. Uh, and then firms with over 500 developers or more in that group, the largest size of the SSG was 3%. So as a benchmark, somewhere around 1% to 3% of your SSG team to the number of developers seems like the goal to shoot for. And of course, it all depends on the size of your organization, your mission, the business that you're in, and the information you're trying to protect. So just some advice and notes on building your Software Security Center of Excellence. Uh, number one, getting started. So securing executive sponsorship is critical. You have to get executive buy-in and executive skin in the game. Uh, believe me, you will need this when it comes time to prioritize security alongside with feature development, product roadmap, and, and other stakeholders and other challenges to the business. Everyone's got a got a uh, say in what the development team should work on next. So getting visibility and sponsorship for security at the top down is, is critical for your success. Additionally, the charter and scope should be written, documented, and shared within the organization on a, on a wiki or the corporate internet. Make sure this is documented, shared, and everyone has access to it and, and visibly understands it. Uh, <clears throat> your goals and objectives need to be defined, achievable, and measurable. Assuming you've done the first three, you want to make sure you're aligned with R&D. So you make sure that they are aligned and in agreement with your scope, your charter, the goals of your SSDLC. If not, iterate, go back again until you have that alignment. Uh, additionally, when you're working with engineering, you know, make sure you understand the procedures and tools they use today. You know, are they, are they using agile? Are they doing scrum? Are they doing continuous integration? What's their product life cycle look like? What does their roadmap look like? Make sure your security group understands the environment and has that business awareness of the product development life cycle, uh, before you, before you start. And then start with internal evangelism. Again, the blogs, internal blogs, internal wikis, corporate intranet, Slack channels, teams, uh, establishing a, a forum where you can put out your guidance, put out your guidelines, 
get discussion going, ask for feedback. Uh, these are all important goals to start building a culture and to start evangelizing security. And then also the, the SSCE is responsible to you know, look at and see what platforms are we using, what languages, what type, what type of um, vulnerabilities are being discovered, and identify tools to address and identify those types of issues. So those are some points on you know, getting started. Now let's look at if you already have a software security group and you're looking to kind of level up and take things further and improve the program. So number one, you know, stay focused on the customer. R&D is your customer. And as you progress, you need to remember that their needs come first in terms of helping them achieve security in their workflow. You have to align and make Make it so that they can accomplish their goal of, of shipping software uh, and you're serving their need and helping them achieve security in their software delivery. Uh, we'll go from the getting starting phase to leveling up. Now we're, we're enforcing and publishing SSDLC standards, procedures, and best practices. Uh, we're no longer just sharing ideas, but we're enforcing standards. And then as, as you grow and as the team continues to grow and scale, you want to start identifying you know, promising members of the development organization that have a knack for security, uh, promote them uh, or designate them as security champions, or maybe they might be interested in joining the Security Software Center of Excellence uh, and coming on to uh, the core team. <clears throat> and as you scale, you know, external evangelism comes a, a bigger part of the program. So not only are you um, selling internally, but now you're publicly talking about your program, going uh, to trade shows and giving talks, going to uh, conferences, uh, <clears throat> blog posts, engaging with customers, and, um, and doing a lot more outbound public marketing of your security program and the security of your, your products that, that you're delivering. And as you scale up, of course, DevSecOps automation, uh, really leveling up requires automation and continuous delivery at DevOps speed. And we'll talk about some of that here today. And then data-driven program management. Again, as you scale to 100, 150, 1,000 products in your catalog, you, know, you need to measure uh, the activities, measure what your team is doing, measure the security issues that are being discovered, in the products that you're working with, uh, mine that data to improve your product process, to improve your team's workflow, to improve your team's charter. So I'll give you an example. Um, in our company, we looked at um, defects that were being reported on certain, a certain category of products. And we discovered across all of these products, 25% of the reported issues were third-party component related. So we initiated a program and a procedure to improve our software composition analysis and select some new tools and some better procedures to reduce that specific type of vulnerability. So the next role I'll talk about is the security champion. Uh, so the security champion is, uh, here's, you can see what Sam, their definition for security champion, and you can also see some statistics from BSAM, uh, the, the, from BSIN. Uh, the important thing here is that the security champion is defined for each development team. And 42% of the firms in the BSIM study 42% of them have a security champions program and 65% of the firms have uh, a program if they've been part of the BSIM study more than one time. So now we'll look at some specifics on you know, building that security champions program and leveling up the security champions program. You can see also some, some, uh, some companies call these security champions, others call it security point of contact or the SPOC. Uh, <clears throat> so you can choose a, a creative name 
that works for you. Um, but the uh, idea here is to identify individuals with a passion and an interest for security. Volunteers work a lot better than voluntold. So it's always better to find the folks that are already coming to you asking about security topics, asking about privacy, raising security issues, coming to you with, with challenges and things to work on already. Those are the folks you want to identify and, and name as your security champions. Uh, what the security champions' main responsibility is to execute the secure development lifecycle procedures, the testing, the threat modeling, the security scanning, inside of the development project that they work on. So they're kind of the single point of, or the, the point of contact for the SSG, as well as the individual on the team who's responsible, hands on the keyboard for setting up uh, and executing the scans. They'll also work with the DevOps team uh, and others on the team to instrument the tooling, uh, as well as um, uh, some other activities we'll, we'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> but triaging the findings that come back from the tooling, getting that into the backlog. In terms of scaling the program, uh, once um, you know, you're know you kind of up and running and scaling, now you're looking at multiple full-time champions per project. Some teams and some development teams will have multiple SPOCs. Uh, some will have multiple full-time security champions working on one development project uh, or a set of microservices for one product. Uh, again, as you scale up and mature, uh, your security champions are likely going to be pushing the curve. Um, they're going to be identifying improvements, identifying new procedures, new security tools that you can then leverage back within the SSG and also leverage through other to other development projects using these tools and, and advancements. And then also sometimes the uh, security champions, uh, as you evolve, these these team members will eventually make their way onto your central secure software team uh, or your software security group and uh, and be core members of the SSG. Some gotchas and some anti-patterns to look out for with SPOCs. Uh, number one is if your SPOC is the only member of the team responsible for security, then uh, and all security tasks and questions are assigned to the SPOC. Now the SPOC should be working with DevOps and build managers to prioritize and automate security testing into the pipeline. It is not always the SPOC's responsibility to create the pipeline or create the DevOps tooling to run the scans. The SPOC's responsible to help triage and review the findings and then put them into the backlog but then the entire development team is responsible to work on that backlog fixing security issues. Uh, again, <clears throat> the, uh, the second bullet here, the second anti-pattern is you know, if, if the SPOC is responsible to prioritize security into the product delivery cycle. And uh, the third anti-pattern is if there's an adversarial or subordinate relationship between the SSG and the security champion um, so for the last two bullets, you know, in terms of responsibilities for priorities and uh, it's the engineering manager and the product manager and the executives to responsible to prioritize security. It's not the SPOC's role to prioritize security. Uh, you don't want to make the SPOC's job harder than it is already by also making them now convince their boss that security is priority. This has to be top-down, driven from the executive, top-down. So the executives are responsible to prioritize security. The engineering managers, the product managers are responsible to be aware and have visibility on the security of their product and they're accountable to make sure security is accomplished within their roadmap, within their delivery cycle. It's not the SPOC's responsibility to prioritize and f as far as the uh, the third bullet, you know, again, making sure that 
your SSG, keeps in mind that R&D is the customer, the SPOC is the customer, the SSG is serving the security champion. It's not a blaming culture. If the product is failing security, it's a business, organizational, product management issue, it's not the SPOC's fault. So we want to execute in a blameless culture in a blameless environment. So now we've established who the role players are, uh, how do we get teams to know and apply what we need them to do? Quote here, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. So I'll talk about three core components for the education and awareness part of culture. Uh, number one is structured training programs. So we've got mandatory developer security training, advanced, role specific, and platform specific training, which is a little more hands on. Um, the mandatory, this is for all developers. Uh, when they hire on, they are required to take a training and then either annually or biannually after that, take a refresher. Uh, <clears throat> the advanced blue belt classes, these are for you know, more role specific, platform specific, language specific, where we want to get more hands on into you know, fixing code and looking at specific problems in the language that they work every day and do hands-on exercises, hands-on coding challenges uh, related to their day-to-day -day responsibility. And the black belt is more behavioral uh, achievements and certifications. So this can be uh, hosting a security meetup, writing a security blog post, uh, publishing something internally or externally. Uh, these are all behaviors that uh, contribute to someone's achievement of the black belt. And it may take several years to build out a training program and to uh, see a cohort go from white belt to blue belt to black belt. Um, <clears throat> so obviously if you're just starting out, start with the mandatory developer security training uh, which will include, you know, the top 10 OWASP vulnerabilities, common security um, mistakes uh, developers make, and uh, spreading that awareness around uh, common challenges. The third uh, bucket here on the slide is security events. Uh, these are kind of security days where we do a, a workshop day. We'll have someone from the SSG go into the, um, the site uh, R&D site or within a team and do some immersion. Uh, usually we'll do some, some structured training uh, and then do some tournament uh, or challenges. Uh, we also use uh, capture the flags. Uh, this is a great way to, again, bring people together in a fun way. Uh, it's hands-on, it's fun, it gets people interacting and, and really kind of seeing some real world challenges uh, either on sort of the capture the flag type of uh, targets or even setting up challenges where they get to attack and, and hack into their, their own products. Uh, <clears throat> just uh, mention here, we use uh, OWASP Security Shepherd as one of the tools we use for capture the flags. And there's a lot of other great uh, tools out there, open source and, and commercial you can use here. And then finally, the third part is the uh, recognitions and rewards. We really want to uh, reward and praise uh, people for taking uh, the initiative and for um, for taking advantage of the training available to them and, and going the extra 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 mile as needed in their products and, and across these challenges. So you know, publicly praising them in Slack, Teams, company intranet. Uh, <clears throat> you can launch a security stars program where again you on a periodic basis, either quarterly or monthly or just ad hoc, you know name who the security stars are for that, for that, um, for that time period and announce them publicly. Um, and also, of course, a little swag and some inexpensive, inexpensive gift cards can go a long way. So this is a fun and engaging way to do kind of breed awareness and uh, brand your application security program, have t-shirts made, uh, come up with a logo for your team uh, and share those as awards. And also, of course, you know, hit up your vendors. Um, they're a great uh, source, uh, resource for hoodies, stickers, and other fun giveaways. 
So now we're going to uh, move into the second area we talked about and highlight some of the processes and technologies needed at the foundation level and also what's needed to advance uh, your program. So the first step is to define your security gates and passing criteria. And I just highlighted, uh, this is from the Microsoft SDL, but I'm highlighting here kind of three areas we're going we're gonna to focus on uh, at, this, uh, at this point. Uh, <clears throat> so establishing security requirements. The idea here is this is the optimal time to define the requirements as upfront during the initial planning phases of the product. And we want to integrate security in a way that it doesn't disrupt delivery and the life cycle of the product. So letting the team know upfront as far in advance when they start developing this project, you know, what are the security requirements? What are the security bars? What do what does the development team need to do in order to achieve a passing grade on your security requirement? <clears throat> and so this is really important to document this. It's really important to meet with the teams and go over the security requirements so that everyone knows what they are. Uh, it's really, it, it, it builds trust in the program. It improves understanding. Um, lets us reduce friction and frustration at the end of the process. No one likes surprises. Uh, engineering will be frustrated and lose goodwill if requirements are constantly moving or not well defined. And so here in a typical SDL, we would define our requirements. In the requirements phase, the t development team executes the procedures. And then when we get to the release phase, then we will have a final security review or FSR, where we check and verify that the team has hit the requirements that, that were agreed to at the start of the project. So this uh, next pro tip draws some inspiration from these words, from Bruce Lee again. Be shapeless, formless like water. Water can flow or water can crash. Be water. And what does that mean with respect to our security program? Well. What this means is you want to merge your security into the existing development cycle. First, you identify the gates and collect the results, but don't enforce them yet. You want to flow into the process like water. You're not here to cause a team and development crash at this stage. You want to show up, observe the security posture of the product, observe what the team is doing, and adapt your security requirements to the tools and instruments that are in place and already in use by the developers. And so uh, this, both of these uh, statements come from the BSIM. So defining checks, but without enforcing them is also a tip from, from BSIM. Uh, and so again, what this means is that you know, we're going to define the security metrics, the security criteria we want to look at. Uh, we can decide which points in the process we should be doing these security requirements, but we will not start enforcing them straight out of the gate. We'll just observe and then when the team gets comfortable with the tools, when the team gets comfortable with the metrics, then we'll choose an agreed upon timeline to then start enforcing them and making them mandatory. But first, just observe. And so for security gates and defining security bars and security requirements, I'm just going to give an example here. Here's what one security gate might look like for one control. So software component analysis. So for software component analysis, for ISR and FSR, the project is scanned using the approved SCA tools. All results are reviewed by the development team. And then, if, assuming we're doing enforcement now, all critical, high, and medium issues are resolved prior to the release. Again, it doesn't have to be 
extremely verbose, uh, just something that's clear, concrete, measurable. You can put it in writing to the development team. They can see exactly what the requirement is. They know how to measure it, and they know that they know how to know if they've achieved and passed the security bar. And so in practice, you'll follow kind of a pattern like this. Um, on the other security gates or security bars you need for your for your environment. So for example, you may have bars for threat modeling, secure design review, static application testing, container analysis, attack surface analysis, and dynamic scanning. Each of these controls will have a security bar definition that says how do you test this, how do you measure it, and what's the passing criteria for that bar. Now in the process section here, so far we've covered the foundational aspects to defining your SDLC process. Now we'll take a look at what this looks like at scale in a DevOps world. Keeping pace with continuous delivery, continuous deployment, and continuous security. So I like this quote from Bruce Lee here. I fear not who has practiced 10,000 kicks, but I fear the one who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. So that 10,000 times is what we're talking about here now is that the SDLC is great, uh, but how do you do that 10,000 times? How do you do 100 releases per week or per day if needed and still meet your security requirements? Uh, so that's kind of the, the subject now. Uh, we're going to move into my, more of an advanced SDLC uh, at scale, you know, now we're talking about continuous security and DevSecOps. So we'll go through all of the details on this slide, uh, but the point here is that in today's DevOps lifecycle, where we have frequent small changes, your MVP, hot fixes, minor changes, etc., all going out multiple deployments, sometimes per day, there isn't enough time to perform 100% of the manual security tests and sometimes the automated security tests on every single change and release to production. So how do we overcome that and scale security requirements to DevOps speed and scale? There's no longer a shift left. As you can see, there is no left. It's, it's a shift everywhere. So now security is ingrained in every step of the DevOps lifecycle. So here's a, a notional example of what a continuous security pipeline at scale would kind of look like. Uh, obviously, it requires a high level of uh, automation and orchestration. And again, this is just an example. Uh, there's some, some vendor names and examples here on this slide. Again, these are just notional examples. Uh, they are not meant to endorse any of these, uh, these vendors. Uh, just some examples of some that we've seen. Um, so here, what we're illustrating is that security is integrated into the CI pipeline. And security monitoring is integrated into operations, telemetry, and procedures. Uh, <coughs> defect management is centralized. Backlog, backlog management is centralized. And it's all integrated. Uh, and we want to use the same system that the engineers use every single day to do their work. That's where we want the security information and the security tasks, security defects, all entered into that same information that the engineers are looking at every day. Security can't be something that happens uh, on the side or at the end uh, and dropping off a report to someone to now go look through a, a document to figure out what needs to be done. Uh, the security tooling is integrated uh, directly into the engineering and development pipeline. <clears throat> so we'll kind of just quickly go through this um, example here. Uh, we won't spend too much time on it. Uh, again, if you, if you want more details about this or the, or the previous slide, ping me and I'll be happy to, um, to, to share more depth. Uh, but in this example, you can see that security tests are done before deploying to staging. Once we deploy to stage, we run, we run the dynamic uh, 
testing and surface analysis testing, if it passes those tests, then we can deploy to production. And for out-of-band tests that don't happen during the pipeline, we, we check via APIs to see the latest result from those tools. For example, uh, in threat modeling, uh, you can check and see has this product or feature had a threat model, and if so, are there any open or outstanding issues that were raised from that threat model that haven't been addressed yet. So another uh, quick example before we move on, you know, highlighting on that last slide what a kind of end-to-end -end, uh, security automation framework looks like. Now we're going to take a kind of deeper look into an actual CI CD pipeline with security built in. Um, <clears throat> the, the point and example here is you know, developers want pipelines that run fast. They want fast build time and they want immediate feedback. Uh, the problem with that is some security tests cannot be done on every single build. Um, so what a CI pipeline like this would do is on the test that can be run directly in the pipeline. So for example, dependency check uh, for composition analysis and uh, twist lock for container scan, they will be run in line. Anything that happens uh, either uh, maybe on a weekly basis or is a manual process, they will just go and fetch the latest result from that job. And then as long as everything passes, then the build passes and the pipeline passes and they can move on to the next stage. So now we've come to the third and final stop on our tour. And, uh, Appreciate your, your patience and attention so far. I'm going to cover two core components on governance, and uh, and then uh, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, so the first concept we're going to talk about is establishing a meaningful metric and KPIs, and the second point we'll talk about is handling security exceptions and risk acceptance as part of your SDLC process. So in this example. I'm um, sharing some KPI metrics and dashboards. Um, <clears throat> in this example I'm showing, we have a uh, aggregated risk score, and this risk level is determined by an aggregation of all the components included in this product. You can see kind of by by product, but then also by component, you know what the what the score is, and then this score is made up of the individual results. Uh, of the various security scans and security requirements for that component. So one of the really important point uh, I'm trying to illustrate here is that, you know, number one, uh, you want to aggregate this information, you want to aggregate the metrics, and use these to communicate risk to the business. You want to share this at the executive level, so that they, you know, see trends and they're aware of the current security posture. Uh, you also want to use this, share it across all, all of R&D, so every team can see how they're doing relative to other areas of the business. You know, measure their trends and then use those trends to improve your program. So the next point uh, related to governance is around accountability. Uh, so we talked about the SDLC process and how the product and engineering projects have to achieve a pass uh, in the security bar to move forward. Uh, we kind of touched on what happens if a product doesn't meet the security gate, and that's what we're talking about here. So remember, at the end, the goal is to release software and get our valuable products out into the customer's hands. Uh, we don't live in an ideal world where every engineering project is going to meet every requirement on every release, whether we're talking about quality, feature development, security tests. Um, occasionally, at least once in a while, you may have a scenario where a, a product is trying to hit a release target date and needs to move forward. So this is why we have an exception procedure, and this is a critical part of the business so that um, a hot fix or important release is not caught in, in a loop and getting blocked due to a security finding that may not be a high risk. 
Uh, and so what does a security exception or risk approval process look like? Well, first, uh, requires a mitigation plan and a timeline. And the timeline and plan should be relative to the risk and the severity. And requires approval documented in a system of records. So the official approval should be documented and depending on the issue and level of severity, escalate up to the executive level to get that approval. This way it's the line of business and the executive that owns the risk. The development team is not owning the risk. The SPOC doesn't own the risk. The business managers and the executives own the risk. Uh, and the, the most important point here is that we capture these approvals and mitigation plans in our system of record, in our engineering tooling. So in this case, we're using JIRA uh, to make sure that the approval is captured, but also that we enforce it with our automation system and orchestration so that if we agree to fix something by, uh, by December, and the engineering team is now trying to release in December and they haven't fixed that issue yet, then that will block the build, that will block the release, and they will have, uh, have to go back and resolve and meet their mitigation plan or, or the project is blocked. And so that, again, is necessary when really we want to scale the risk acceptance program uh, and, and, and achieve this at scale across 100, 150 products, you need to make sure that that uh, decision is enforced in an automated fashion. And so now I'm uh, going to wrap up here. Uh, just to recap, uh, we explored the foundations in the three key areas, culture, process, and governance. And I gave examples that you can take. Number one, if you're just getting started and building a program, but also hopefully if, uh, if you're looking to improve your AppSec program and improve your AppSec program to the next stage, some takeaways and actions you can take uh, to go to the next level. So the advice and, uh, and takeaways, again, uh, begin where you are. Focus on these foundations. Set yourself up for success and some questions to ask as you go along. You know, what are the critical risks and objectives for your business? Start small. Use iteration and minimum viable product and that mindset to get things moving. Establish some success and build from there. So I hope you found something useful. Uh, really uh, would love to hear your feedback. Please let me know your thoughts. Where you can find me uh, on social media, usually um, here. LinkedIn is the one I usually check. Uh, shoot me a private message or mention me in a comment. Uh, greatly appreciate any thoughts, comments, feedback, disagreements, complaints, arguments, uh, anything at all. Uh, just engage me and I'll be happy to uh, discuss more and share additional details. Thank you very much.